Having an oboe in your film is a great idea. But here are some tips and tricks to help your session go smoother and quicker. It's no secret that the oboe excels with a lush emotional melody. And then, suddenly, an oboe. The middle range is where you get this. examples in film is Thomas Newman's opening title for Angels in America. This solo is one of my favorite ever written for the oboe, including all of the classical repertoire. The original recording was played by Leslie Reed. The combination of his writing, her playing, and the final mix make this one of the best moments for oboe ever. Both of these solos fit right on the staff, so this lush range is pretty easy to remember. But if you want the oboe to really cry, you know, have that tear-inducing sound, then you have to go up to the next octave. This is done wonderfully by Patrick Doyle in Much Ado About Nothing. After Don John devises his plan, we hear a foreshadowing of the innocent tears of Hero. The low register on both instruments works well for mischievous, sinister quirkiness. However, keep in mind, unlike the flute, the oboe and English horn get much louder and more resistant as they head into their lowest notes. In general, the double reeds don't like to fade in from nothing like the single reeds do, and this range really emphasizes that point. I recently did a session for a favorite composer of mine with this orchestration. This was a bit doomed from the start in a live recording situation. It would have blended much nicer with the English horn up an octave, so well in fact that I don't think the change of voicing would have bothered the composer one bit. If you do really want the sound of low English horn with bass flutes and bass clarinet, I would simply stripe it from the beginning. Since you won't get the mix you want live, striping it will allow you to get that blend in post, and your session will save both time and morale. Dating back into classical repertoire, the oboe is frequently used to show playfulness and oddity. Who invited that guy? Like almost anything in film music, there's a great example by John Williams. This theme comes from Harry Potter. 
There are many quirky characters in that series, but this theme belongs to none other than Gilderoy Lockhart. <laughs> the Yolo can play fast. But for whatever reason, it's more common we find fast notes in 2D sections rather than solos. The oboe can play a long time on one breath. However, take note to how brilliantly orchestrated this passage is to make this work. The oboe is in that rich Thomas Newman range, so projection is going to be easier. The rest of the music is quite sparse, and only gets active during the oboe's held notes. The other instruments are far away from the same frequencies and pitches, allowing the oboe line to stand out easily. Lastly, there are a number of rests before this solo, and a number of rests after. This allows the player plenty of time to tank up and start fresh, and then recover afterward. If you want to study orchestration, I would focus on Respighi. Some may say he's second to Ravel, but I would put him equal. And this covers a different set of techniques that you will find equally valuable. For wind instruments, articulations and slurs are not phrase markings. We can play the same shape of phrase independently of slurs and staccatos. They are also very different from string bowings. Oboes have much more lung than a violin has a bow in one direction. We phrase based on the harmony and counterpoint of the other instruments. Here's an example. So I'm not going to simply phrase it to the slurs like this. Because that doesn't fit with the rest of the ensemble. Instead, I'll keep the correct phrasing and use the articulation as a spice. Likewise with this one, unless there is a compelling musical reason in the rest of the accompaniment, like many waltzes or Brahms too, I'm still going to keep the phrasing independent of the articulations. That G will still be a pickup into bar 4, even though it is slurred to the note before and separated to the note after. lets the articulation be an added layer to your music, instead of a mere copy of a string bowing or phrase shape. Sometimes I get parts at a session without articulations. That's okay as an opt-out, but we may need to hear the cue once before we find that magic combo. The English horn, or anguish horn, is both similar and the complete opposite of the oboe. Where the oboe is strident, the English horn is somber. Where the oboe cries, the English horn mourns. Where the oboe loves, the English horn reflects. The fingerings are the same, it's just that the English horn is pitched a fifth lower in F, like the French horn. Oddly, the English horn is in English, and it's not a horn. It's French, and it used to be curved like a French horn. It was called the angled horn, or cor anglais. The British heard this and thought, hey, cor anglais, English horn, cool, we have our own instrument, and the name stuck. When the British asked the French if they'd like an English horn, they said no, that they'd already got one, and it was very nice. So it's French, but not like a French horn, which is German. The most notable feature is the pear-shaped bell, which gives the English horn its hollow and mellow sound, but it also reduces the projection of the sound. When writing English horn solos, good composers know to keep the rest of the ensemble out of the way, in frequency and in texture. We can hear the range comparison with oboe. I've used written ranges here, since the tones are corresponding to the part of the instrument, not the relative range within the orchestra.
This solo has almost the identical range of the Thomas Newman oboe solo from Angels in America. The crying octave on oboe sounds a little bit different on English horn. We already spoke about the low range being good for mischief. Here's a great example by John Ottman from The Usual Suspects. The oboe and English horn can play multiphonics, and they're wonderful for horror movie texture. It's important to note that the skills needed to play oboe and English horn are a little different. Furthermore, the skills needed to play second oboe versus first oboe are also quite different. Your first call for first oboe may not necessarily be your first call for English horn, and your second call for Prince oboe may not be your best second oboe. Many principal and second oboists stay away from English horn, and many great English horn players are better at cor anglais than oboe. When I contracted for a symphony, I made sure our lists for E flat, principal, second, and bass clarinets were different, based on the player's specific abilities. Although there was certainly overlap in the names on each list, they were not in the same order. You may find this a small detail, but the oboes from country to country vary a great deal. So much so that many of them have different fingerings from each other. This may seem like a detail of color, but it's something to keep in mind if you know you're going to be recording in Los Angeles versus London versus Prague or any other wonderful musical city. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this and gained some tidbits to allow you to fearlessly write for the oboe. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask. We want you to own oboe and English horn writing so we can continue to hit people right in the fields when needed. Happy writing, and see you in the session.